The fight for Texas did not end in 1836. The battles during the Texas Revolution were a small fraction of what was to come and the struggle for the Lone Star State. There was ongoing fighting with Mexicans for decades along the southern border. Comanches and other groups of Native Americans continuously raided Texas settlers. Then, during the Civil War, Texas was more vulnerable to attack and the western edge of settlements was pushed back further east. Now this video will likely touch a nerve with many people. I'm not here to discuss the rightness or wrongness of what the American settlers did, the morality of their actions. However, when considering what the first couple generations of Texas legends accomplished and endured in order to stabilize the land, one conclusion that I came to was, they must have been some of the toughest, meanest, and most aggressive sons of bitches in history. I'm literally talking about the survival of the fittest here, only a group of people weeded out through generations of struggle to have the best combination of toughness, aggression, experience, and intelligence would prevail in these circumstances. These were the people that had sailed across the Atlantic and settled in a new land, fought off the British, pushed westward across the Appalachians, hunting and fighting along the way, and then ultimately crossed the Sabine River legally or illegally into Texas. By this point in time, Many of these people were prolific marksmen, hunters, fighters, and survivalists, exhibiting a greater determination and willingness to take risks than the average person. The Spanish Empire that had a vast territory across North and South America could only muster a few widely scattered permanent settlements across Texas. They barely managed to control a small fraction of the area. In any attempt to expand their territory in the 1700s and the Comanches didn't waste time wiping them off the map. A great example of this is the Presidio de San Saba in the 1750s. Texas was part of the newly formed nation of Mexico for 13 years and they knew very well how dangerous the Comanches, Apaches, and other groups of Native Americans were. They were also dealing with multiple attempts at revolution south of the Rio Grande during this time including the short-lived Republic of the Rio Grande, which named the city of Laredo its capital. In the end, in my view, neither Spain nor Mexico put forth their greatest efforts to secure Texas, as they were likely more concerned with known gold and silver mine areas further south. To them, Texas was merely a buffer, and by the beginning of the Texas Revolution, Americans vastly outnumbered Mexicans in the territory. One thing that set the Comanches apart from Native Americans east of the Mississippi River is that they were warriors mounted on horseback. All eastern tribes farmed, hunted, and fought on foot and occupied a relatively small space. Originally, the Comanches were generally a hunter-gatherer tribe for Wyoming, not native to Texas. However, many Mustang horses from Spain's empire were let loose into the wild over the years and spread across the high plains. The Comanches soon put them to use like no one else in those times. They became highly skilled at fighting and hunting on horseback. They raided Spanish territory, Mexico, Texas, and other areas over the decades. They could strike from hundreds of miles away and be long gone before anything could be done about it. This was one of the primary reasons that Mexico was willing to allow Americans to settle the once sparsely populated territory we now call Texas. The Comanches didn't just do this to European invaders, inflicting tremendous misery on other Native American tribes as well. For example, the Apaches had been pushed out of West Texas by the Comanches in the early to mid 1700s and were their bitter enemies. The first decade after Texas became a republic, it was sparsely populated and did not have tremendous resources. Mexico still had plans to reclaim it and attack multiple times from the south. Additionally, they faced a constant threat from the Comanches to the west. Though the early Texans were highly skilled with weapons like the Kentucky rifle, this gun, with its long reload times, was not effective in battle. The natives would wait until they fired their weapons, then charge and spear them with a lance before they could reload. For every shot they fired, the Comanches could shoot several arrows while riding on a moving horse. Texans and Americans also had horses, but they were not nearly as skilled nor did their breeds have the endurance of the Mustangs and the semi-arid western terrain. By the year 1840, most of the eastern tribes had been largely wiped out with the last remnants pushed into Oklahoma Territory. 
However, the Comanches still had firm control on at least the western half of Texas. After several were killed in the famous Council House fight in San Antonio, the Comanches swept down to the coastal plain from central Texas, raided the town of Victoria, and then completely destroyed Linville. As they returned to central Texas with their spoils, they were attacked near Lockhart and the Battle of Plum Creek by a group of young men from nearby towns. Among them was John Coffey Hayes, AKA Jack Hayes. In this battle, something very important occurred that would begin the process of learning to finally defeat the Comanches in open battle. They attacked them on horseback. It should be noted that Tonqua, Apache, and other groups were very skilled and valuable as scouts prior to many battles over the years. They risked their lives over and over again to the benefit of Texas. The Texas Rangers were first organized in 1836 to protect the New Republic from Native American and Mexican threats. 600 soldiers had been approved, but far fewer than this actually existed at any given point in those times. The only thing that the new resource poor republic provided was ammunition. They were a rough, informal group in the early days and went into the field with few supplies and often hunted for themselves. Fortunately for the Texans, there was a plentiful supply of tough young men looking for adventure in those days. Though little was recorded during the first few years of the Texas Rangers, what's known is that the death rate was very high. The effect was Darwinian, weeding out the weak and leaving behind only the toughest and smartest fighters. A great leader rose among them. He was known as Jack Hayes, a fearless, intelligent man that was cool under pressure. He was polite and soft-spoken, the kind of guy that you might underestimate if you ran into him in a saloon. But he was said to have a piercing gaze that could penetrate the souls of those around him. He was a Superman-like character that seemed to instantly transform into another being the moment it came time to fight. He teamed up with other rangers becoming captain, and his men knew how to ride horses. They crossbred mustangs with Arabian varieties, resulting in horses that were equal to those of the Comanches. They studied the ways of the natives, learning to survive while packing light, and were prepared to fight 24 hours a day. They trained themselves to perform various stunts and hit a target while riding on horseback, transforming into the most efficient and effective warriors in American history. They used the element of surprise, and the strategies that Hayes developed were very effective, helping keep the deaths of his men to a minimum. Hayes also memorized all the strategies of the Comanches, which allowed him to predict their every move. He was a hard worker, mentally tough, and never seemed to be bothered by storms, bad weather, or conditions. Characteristics that made him a strong leader. He instilled confidence in his men, and very often, they were able to defeat much larger groups of soldiers in battle. An example of this was in the city of Laredo in 1841 against a group of Mexican cavalry. Through all of this, the pistols and rifles of the day limited them to only three shots at the outset of any battle. In 1838, an invention by Samuel Colt would change history. But the funny thing is, no one seemed to want it at the time. It was a 36 caliber five-chambered pistol in a strange term of events, a shipment of these weapons were ordered for the Texas Navy, but they were never really used. This impractical firearm somehow found its home in the hands of Jack Hayes in 1843, who immediately recognized its potential. They decided to test it out in 1844 at the Battle of Walker's Creek. Hayes and 15 men encountered a group of 75 Comanches and were surrounded by them. In this battle, they stood their ground on horseback, ultimately killing 20 and wounding 30 while only having one of their men killed. The success of this engagement caused a massive shift in the way battles were fought going forward. Interestingly enough, while the Rangers were discovering the benefits of this five-chambered pistol, Samuel Colt had gone bankrupt and his operations had shut down. However, he caught wind of the successes of Jack Hayes and the Rangers. He collaborated with Samuel Walker, who helped him improve the design. The new gun had a larger barrel, shot 44 caliber bullets, and now had six chambers. 
The success of the Texas Rangers using this gun in the Mexican-American War made the pistol legendary and Samuel Colt a very wealthy man. During the Mexican-American War in the mid-1840s, Texas Rangers like Jack Hayes, Ben McCulloch, and Samuel Walker proved to be vital as scouts during the campaigns into northern Mexico. However, Zachary Taylor didn't like their rough and aggressive behavior and wanted them gone as soon as possible. The Rangers had become efficient and aggressive killing units and didn't have the patience for the politics of war and many left the area during quieter periods of the conflict. In 1847, General Winfield Scott led an army into the Mexico City area, but his supply lines were cut off by small bands of Mexicans. Just as the situation quickly became quite perilous, Captain Samuel Walker, Texas Ranger, entered the fray. He began the process of looting and wiping out guerrillas in the area and was very effective. Jack Hayes also arrived in central Mexico. He was given the responsibility of leading mounted warriors to protect the road to Scott's army, and it was at this time that a fresh shipment of a thousand Samuel Colt revolvers arrived. Samuel Walker and his men fought Santa Ana's army in October of 1847. The U.S. Army prevailed, but toward the end of the battle, he was killed. Captain John Rip Ford was also among the fighters in the war and said that when the Rangers entered the capital city, they were greeted like rock stars. Everyone wanted to get a look at the legends known as Los Diabolos Tejanos. They had conducted themselves in a ruthless manner in ways the regular soldiers typically did not and had a zero tolerance policy for any Mexican that tried to mess with them. The U.S. Army essentially used them to do their dirty work and then got rid of them as quickly as they could. However, by the end of the war, the Rangers and the Colt Revolver became not only national but international sensations. In the late 1850s, American settlers began pushing into Comanche territory west of Fort Worth further than anyone had attempted to before. In retaliation, Comanche raids increased with frequency and intensity, with many settlers being tortured and killed in brutal fashion. By this point, Jack Hayes and most of the earlier generation of battle-hardened Texas Rangers were long gone. The U.S. government then mismanaged the situation terribly. The Army had been instructed to follow a passive policy and were told not to cross the Red River into Oklahoma in pursuit of the natives. Two lines of forts were built along the western frontier, but the soldiers had no idea how to fight mounted Comanche warriors. It seemed as though all of the knowledge gained in the 1840s had been completely forgotten. However, there was one great warrior left that had been trained by and fought alongside Jack Hayes. His name was John Rip Ford. The governor of Texas called upon him to help take care of the problem, going against the passive policies of the federal government. Ford trained his men in the aggressive old ways and also recruited several native scouts. They then rode north of the Red River and crushed a group of Comanches led by Iron Jacket, who was said to be invincible in the Battle of Antelope Hills. In 1860, the brutality of raids caused many settlers to pack up and head back further east. An event then occurred that may have significantly changed the course of history. Charles Goodnight led a scouting expedition and discovered a large camp of raiding Comanches led by Peta Nakona. A rising star by the name of Sol Ross, who had fought with John Rip Ford at the Battle of Antelope Hills, would then lead a larger group to confront them. In this battle they killed Peta Nakona, but to their surprise, discovered a woman with blue eyes living in the Comanche camp. It turns out this was a woman named Cynthia Ann Parker, the wife of Peta Nakona, who had been captured by the Comanches many years before. During this battle, her two sons, one of them a 12-year-old named Quana, managed to escape on horseback. She would never see them again, but mourn them the rest of her days. Life for Quana was much more difficult after the loss of his parents, but he grew to be tall and strong, a natural leader. This transformation into a great warrior took place during the Civil War years. 
U.S. Army soldiers vacated the line of forts along the edge of Comanche territory during the Civil War. The best Texas men and resources were focused elsewhere, and the western frontier became even more vulnerable to attack. The losses in the 1840s, and again in the late 1850s, had weakened the Comanche Empire considerably, but the Civil War gave them time to strengthen and regroup. During this period, they raided the agricultural tribes of Oklahoma Territory repeatedly. Additionally, there was tremendous infighting between other groups. In a relative sense, Oklahoma Territory may have been bloodier than the Civil War itself during this time. Conditions were so bad that a large refugee camp formed in Kansas with thousands of natives from multiple tribes. In 1864, as the Civil War dragged on and the western frontier of Texas was being pushed back to the east, General Carleton in New Mexico was becoming increasingly irritated by Comanche and Kiowa raids. He sent Colonel Kit Carson, an experienced fighter, to deal with the problem. He traveled with his men to the Canadian River Valley of what is now the Texas Panhandle, an area that very few American or European men had ever laid eyes upon. He left with a group of 400 men that included several native scouts. They brought with them equipment that would prove valuable to their survival, two howitzers, basically like a mini cannon or a shotgun on steroids. They traveled to an abandoned trading post known as Adobe Walls, where they encountered nearly 2,000 Comanche and Kiowa. They fired the howitzers, which caused the other side to pause and go back to their village. The natives must have come up with a new strategy in the meantime, because when they returned, they spread their men out. As the battle wore on, more and more warriors streamed in from the camp, eventually swelling to 3,000 or more. Carson knew they were in danger of being surrounded by this much larger army and began the process of making a tactical retreat. As they backed away and night fell, they fired the howitzer repeatedly. This gave them the time and space they needed to get away, and they managed to with minimal losses. This became known as the First Battle of Adobe Walls. After the Civil War, the U.S. government worked much harder to get the Comanches to move to Oklahoma Territory. They tried to persuade them by allowing them to keep their stolen horses and rewarding them with large gifts at peace treaties, but this only encouraged them to keep on raiding. Eventually, President Grant became frustrated enough to turn to a rapidly rising star in the Army during the Civil War, Ranald McKenzie. He was stationed at Fort Concho in 1871, and very early on had several horses stolen by a group of Quahatis led by Quanah Parker. After a brief skirmish, his men with several Tonkawa scouts pursued them up and down the Llano Estacado, but the Comanches were quite skilled at throwing them off the trail. Eventually, a severe winter storm hit and they gave up the pursuit. Though this expedition could be regarded as a failure, it was a valuable lesson for Mackenzie and signaled something much more significant. For the first time, there was a leader determined enough to pursue them deep into the heart of their territory. They also had guns that were much more advanced than the revolvers that Jack Hayes had used, Spencer rifles. These were used heavily during the Civil War. The guns could shoot at much faster rate and were accurate from long distances. In 1872, there was an escalation in the severity of raids and the brutality of killings once more. Mackenzie became more and more obsessed with his mission. He explored the Llano Estacado for many days, pushing himself and his men, becoming more familiar with the terrain. During this time, they developed the toughness necessary to be successful against the ever-hardened Comanche warriors. They finally discovered a camp along the North Fork of the Red River. They attacked quickly and aggressively, killing 52 and capturing 124 prisoners while only losing four soldiers. They also captured many horses, but in doing so would learn another valuable lesson. Mackenzie had left the horses lightly guarded and in typical fashion, the Comanches snuck in that night to take their horses back. From that moment forward, he ordered all horses captured to be immediately shot and killed. This attack had one major effect. 
It crushed the morale of the tribe. An attack of this magnitude in the heart of their territory had never happened before. One phenomenon was taking place during this time that would be the final straw for free roaming Comanche and Kiowa across Texas, the arrival of the buffalo hunters. They killed millions during the 1870s, destroying the horse tribe's source of food and way of life. These hunters would kill several in just one hour. They had groups of men that would strip off the skins and leave the rest of the bodies to rot in large piles on the plains. A trading post was built along the Canadian River near the site of the Battle of Adobe Walls. No one raised a fuss about the slaughter of millions of buffalo as it was soon discovered that this was doing more damage than decades of efforts before. In addition, Mackenzie's men began intercepting and destroying raiding parties with greater frequency. As they chipped away at this once great empire, the formerly distinct Comanche bands began to break down and their way of life became further corrupted by American materialism. Then, in the twilight of Comancheria, a prophet arose named Isatai, who claimed to possess great magical powers, including the ability to raise people from the dead. Witnesses spread his legend across the land. Like many false prophets before and since, he convinced the Comanches to do things that would ultimately accelerate their destruction. He said that he ascended into the clouds and had been granted the power to defeat the white man and return the nation to its former glory. He teamed up with Quana, and together they began preaching their gospel. In one large gathering of all the bands, they attempted to persuade the chiefs to follow their idea. A large percentage refused to follow the plan, but this did not deter them. In June of 1874, hundreds of warriors attacked the trading post of Adobe Walls where 28 men were present. Isatai had everyone convinced that he could not be hurt by bullets. These men at Adobe Walls were prolific hunters and had high-powered long-range rifles with plenty of ammunition. They barricaded themselves in and successfully held off the attack from the much larger group. Quana was injured and Isatai's magic failed, both devastating blows to the morale of this group of Comanche and Cheyenne warriors. However, they were able to regroup and began a campaign of raids across the southern plains. This only caused the U.S. Army to step up their efforts even more. They gathered the largest army ever assembled against Native Americans to battle the last remnants of free-roaming natives of Comancheria. Their territory had been whittled down to Palo Duro Canyon and the surrounding area, the final frontier of Texas. Estimates were that fewer than 1,000 warriors remained of Comanche, Kiowa, and Southern Cheyenne combined. After establishing permanent supply camps, the U.S. Army was more prepared than ever to wage war on the High Plains. For the next few months, a series of small battles occurred as scouts discovered native camps and hideouts tucked away in the canyons. In September of 1874, Ranald McKenzie and his men picked a large trail and followed it. Having learned hard lessons over the last few years, he took extra precautions to secure their horses at night. By this point in time, his men were experienced and tough fighters, able to withstand the elements of the harsh climate. On September 28th, they reached the edge of the mighty Palo Duro Canyon. They instantly realized they had come to the right place as they surveyed five distinct camps along the river below. This was essentially the capital and last refuge of Comancheria. They were spotted as they descended near the bottom of the canyon and the natives quickly took action to help their families escape. The army moved through the camps and discovered large quantities of food and supplies. The natives attempted to attack from the canyon walls but were quickly repelled. Then Mackenzie gave the order to burn the villages to the ground. They captured over a thousand horses and returned to camp. Later the next morning, with the exception of a few of the best horses, they were ordered to shoot and kill them all. Apparently the pile of bones left behind remained there for many years. Amazingly, only four natives were killed in this battle. 
but the destruction of their largest camp and its supplies was a devastating blow, one they would never recover from. Soon after, the majority of the remaining free warriors were forced into Oklahoma Territory. Only one significant group remained at this point, and it was still led by Kwana and Isatai, but they were finally tracked down in May of 1875. After meditating for a period of time, Kwana had received a sign that he should surrender and move to Oklahoma. They left peacefully and arrived on June 2nd and surrendered to the U.S. military at Fort Sill. I'm really only just scratching the surface of this period of history and I left out most of the gory details. There was plenty of brutality from all sides, from the Alamo in 1836 to the final surrender in 1875. Neither Spain, Mexico, or the Republic of Texas control even half of what is now the state of Texas in those years. I once had a viewer say that Spain had officially claimed all of Texas as part of their empire in the late 1500s, to which I replied, just because a small group hiked across it once and drew it on a map doesn't mean they really could rightfully claim it as theirs. Spain could only muster a few scattered settlements at any given point in time, and Mexico brought in Americans to be offered up as sacrifices against the threat, ultimately backfiring in a big way for them. In the end, it was Texan and American settlers, rangers, and soldiers, with the help of vengeful Apache and Tonkawa scouts, that did the heavy lifting of freeing Texas from the threat of some of the most skilled warriors the world has ever seen. However, it's impossible to read this history without feeling tremendous sadness for the great loss of territory and way of life that the native tribes endured. One of the greatest tragedies of all was the fact that Tonkawa scouts were used over and over again in campaigns against the mounted warriors of the plains. They were their eyes and ears but were never rewarded for it after the wars finally ended. The last remnants were forcibly removed in 1884 and sent to Oklahoma. In an interesting turn of events after the Red River War, Quanna and Reynold McKenzie, once bitter rivals and two of the greatest warriors the respective nations had ever known, would go on to become close friends.